Another day, another high-flying SPAC stock announces an intriguing deal. This is Daniel with Unrivaled Investing. Today, we are going to talk about Flying Eagle. The ticker is F-E-A-C. The goal of this video is to go over their recently announced deal to buy Skills. It's a private company. We will go over Skills' business model, their market potential, and lastly, my thoughts on the risk reward. But before digging in, if you're interested in finding companies that could potentially go up hundreds or even thousands of percent, hit subscribe. If you're already a subscriber to this channel, hit the like button. And if you want to support this channel, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. And in addition to supporting this channel, enabling it, I will throw in a lot of free detail like what I own each month, what I'm buying and selling, what's the rationale for my top holdings, so you can learn all this detail um, beyond just these educational videos, you can see what I'm personally doing in my portfolio. Also, if you have any questions about particular stocks, feel free to leave a comment or a question. If you've already subscribed to the channel, leave a comment or question so that way I can see, hey, you're a subscriber and you have a question. So Flying Eagle, ticker FEAC, and Skills are combining, and this was announced on September 2nd. Um, so Flying Eagle is a SPAC, which is a special purpose acquisition vehicle, um, and the ticker is FEAC. And I'm like, really, FEAC? Like, these banker financial types, they have no creativity. And they're like, I see FEAC, and the next letter, I think, is E, um, and then S. And that's just where my mind goes. Like, you can't Flying Eagle, maybe S O A R, soar, or like awesome, or something like feces. Really, that's that's feces. That's that's really where you're going. Personally, I think if they use the ticker S K L Z, that'll be much better, and it'll prevent my mind from going places it honestly doesn't want to go to. Uh, first, what is a SPAC? Uh, so a SPAC is an acquisition vehicle designed to find a company to buy, either in whole or in part, and it's otherwise known as a blank check company. Uh, FEAC has $690 million in cash waiting to find the right partner. So this is a larger SPAC than what you see, some of the smaller ones. Um, and if you want to know more about my thoughts on SPACs in general, check out my video on Hylion. Uh, ticker is SHLL for now, will be HYLN in the future. And uh, yeah, I, I go into more detail on sort of the pitfalls of SPACs where you're, you're avoiding the deep due diligence dive of an IPO process or even a direct listing um, by going through this process. And sometimes the reason why is because they want to avoid certain aspects. Um, like in, in Hylion's case, it's potential like they may not have been able to successfully raise those funds if it were done through a traditional IPO process versus a SPAC investor sort of making a several hundred million dollar speculative bet. So what are the details behind this deal, however, and the sources and uses? Let's go through. So $690 million uh, of FEIC cash plus another about $160 million uh, pipe or private investment. Um, so all in $850 million in cash. There's a lot of cash that's going in. Um, and the cash out, uh, six over $600 million is going to the existing skill shareholders. Like, bring, like that's a red flag in my mind or a bell going off. Like you don't want to see that seventy percent of the proceeds going in are going to existing shareholders. That, like you, ideally you you want like buy-in where you're riding along with with management. Um, so that bothers me. That's a warning sign automatically for for anyone involved in the situation. Um, and the two co-founders, however, I should say the two co-founders will take substantial substantially all in stock, i.e. They might get a ten million dollar payday, as some you know founders do, but uh, they they they'll still take most of their value in stock. Um, and transact to them the next part. So like that, the first part is selling shareholders getting a large amount of money, which is like, um, okay. The next part is transaction expenses. That's fifty six million dollars, or about six and a half percent of the cash in. So this this gets back to it's like. Don't hate the players, hate the game. Um, as long as bankers keep getting paid, and this is a pretty, you know, this is juicy stuff for them. Um, this game of doing SPACs is going to keep going on. And as long as like the SPAC investors are getting, you know, the speculative bump after the deals announced, um, 
you know, this game will keep going on. Uh, so what what are what what is FEAC buying? Um, they're buying skills for and for eight hundred fifty million dollars, they're buying about twenty four percent of skills, and that's an implied valuation of about three point five billion for all of skills. The consolidated picture. And the, the value proposition here is it creates a public vehicle for the existing skill shareholder to sell stock uh, 24 months after this deal closes. And the deal is expected to clo close uh, later this year in the fall 2020. So what does skills do? And they're an enabler of esports competition. So it's in a platform for empowering mobile, mobile game developers to offer tournaments around the world. This is actually really interesting. You know, because you know what you what you see here is they are enabling. This is this is you always have to read the footnotes with this stuff. Um, you know, like what what are they actually like? These figures are cool, but what what where are you getting this from? So this is based on their second quarter figures, which are presumably their best figures yet, um, because it's a rapidly growing company. Um, and they're annualizing their second quarter figures and saying that the they they do around two billion tournaments per year that they enable for game developers and the amount of money so these entry fees paid by users for contests hosted on the skills platform is estimated to be 1.6 billion in 2020 so that's interesting like this is this is a different business model than than i typically hear about um this is more of a toll booth model where you're just sort of collecting the fees as you go in but let's let, this is this is like a platform model this is this strikes me as interesting. Like the economics for platforms, I know could be can be attractive. So this is this is getting interesting. Despite the initial gag factor of selling shareholders getting six hundred million dollars, um, there's some interesting aspects to this in terms of the business. Um, and it seems like they have real traction based on some of the things they're talking about, where they say the they're saying that the minutes per user per day for someone using a skills um, a, a game that's that has skills enabled is sixty two minutes per day which is way higher than these other apps like TikTok is 52 minutes, Facebook's 41 minutes a day. Um, Candy Crush is 37 minutes. And so they're saying they're generating more engagement, 70% more engagement than the number one mobile game. And I think that's comparing to Candy Crush. So the reason why is this important? And the reason why this is important is because it creates an important flywheel dynamic, an important win-win-win dynamic. And as you know, regular viewers know, it's critical to find win-win situations. If you're if you're in any situation that's win-lose, it's inherently not sustainable. If you're in a situation that's win-win-win, that's sustainable and has legs for future growth. So as as I look at this, you know, the reason why this is win-win-win is they are enabling the developers because they are getting users that are more engaged, spending more revenue. If you spend more revenue, the developers can do more cool stuff because they can have a livelihood or they can reinvest in the business, create more content, more users. You get this beautiful fly cycle, uh, fly flywheel that, that you see here. So that's, that's sort of high level. Um, you get these beautiful platform dynamic aspects. What exactly are they offering to the developers? And they're enabling competitive table stakes for the developers. So like um, it's the basic needs that you would need the, the basic the basic functions that you would need to offer competitive tournaments and competitive games to developers. Um, so for example, you can for for game developers, skills offers tournaments and leagues, loyalty and rewards programs, payment management, so make it easy to accept, you know, credit card payments and things like that, anti-cheat and anti-fraud. Is this player winning a skilled game too much, too often? Um, content discussion discovery 24 seven support. So, Hey, if you have a problem setting this up, you can call them social features. So I broadly understand that skills is enabling game developers to host or enable or have competitive tournaments that will attract players to be even more engaged with their games. So this is, this is interesting. Like they, they're a platform that have these tools for their games. Let's, how does skills make money though? Like I understand that they're offering these cool tools for developers, but how do they actually make money? And their business model, like the toll booth model can be really lucrative business model. And here's, here's an example um, where you have two gamers, you know, playing mobile games where the entry fee is 60 cents each. Uh, one wins, one loses. 
Um, 60 cents each gets to a buck 20 in GMB um, or gross, you know, merchandise value. But in this case, it's, it's just um, market value or e-commerce value. It's, it's a virtual good because you're, you're playing a tournament. Um, so one, one twenty in GMB, then a buck Oh four goes to the developers press prizes and incentives. So if you're paying that 60 cent fee, you're not going to get like a hundred percent upside. What you get is, you know, maybe 50% return if you win the game, or maybe it's a 30% return. I, I don't know. It depends on the game. But what's interesting is that skills, their revenue is going to be a 14% take rate. So the way to think about it is the amount of money that's going through their platform, they get 14% of that. That is, that's pretty rich. I mean, there are some platforms, you know, you could think of several e-commerce platforms that have single digit take rates. So this, this means they are offering a lot of value to these developers that they can give up 14%. And, and management has also targeted that, that rate going to 20% over time. That's interesting to me. Um, another business, this is this is sort of a non sequitur, but another business that has a, a nice high take rate like that is, is the trade desk, which is about a 20% take rate. So when you see high take rates, it, it, while it does create sort of risk that that erodes over time, you know, does your 20% take rate go to 10% over time? It also does suggest that right now and potentially in the near future, um, you have a very strong value proposition um, because your, your end customer that's, you know, that, that you're collecting this money from because of this platform, um, they need you. And so they're willing to give up a large percentage. So that's interesting. 95% gross margin, for a platform, you know, like this, this figure checks out, um, and you can see that they they think the contribution margin is around twenty five percent. All these figures make sense to me. Um, you know, when I when I think about platform economics, I'm thinking, you know, 90 percent margin, long term structural margins, 20, 30, 40 percent. And you can see that, like, if you were to look at Alibaba's operating margins, they're like 30, 40 percent for their core, you know, e commerce platform. So how do these economics compare to other games? And the answer is really, really favorably. So you can see skills is about $6.30 average revenue per user versus if you look at Zenga and Glue Mobile, which is an average, and this is based on public figures from 2019, at least per the footnote, of a buck seventy. So what, what skills is saying is by creating these competitive tournaments, you're you're creating um a much healthier revenue flow for the developer. I mean, it's literally multiples of what you can get with other business models. And the other business model, this is a point that they talk about elsewhere, management talks about elsewhere, is that the other business models are flawed, where it's sort of pay to play, um, or you have these really annoying ads that take away from the experience. By creating a tournament aspect, and where you get a cut off the top and a large cut, um, it really does strike me as interesting. Um, and, and that does make sense that it would be that much stickier, that much of a richer environment. Like if you are willing to bet, let's say a dollar to play a game, you're going to be more involved in the game versus just clicking through an ad and getting, you know, that 30 cents or that 20 cents, whatever it is that the company developer gets for those ads. Um, and you could see the different functions that they're offering that help those developers, um, like you could host charity events or brand sponsored tournaments or player incentive optimization. There's a lot of different things that you can do to make tournaments even sexier and drive in more revenue. Um, you could have like team team based tournaments. Uh, you can. There's a lot of things you know you play around with the marketing. You can juice it a lot to get people hyped up to play in a tournament. Um, so how big of an opportunity is skills tapping into? And it's billions, billions and billions of dollars. You always see these in presentations, cracks me up. And so they, they like do high level, like 100 billion international if they go global and new genres, 24 billion. And then Android, because right now it's only iOS, you know, that's 15 billion. And then, you know, if you do a one and a half percent market share, um, you know, the monthly gamers times the skills, average revenue per user, you're like $8 billion. Okay. Like it's a large dollar figure. Okay. Um, but let's actually like 
put on that thinking cap for a second, think critically about like what's their value proposition and, and what actually is the upside. And, you know, like when I think about what they're offering and, and they talk about how like each year, the number of developers or games that they're enabling that have greater than $1 million of annualized GMB. And so think about that, that 1 million GMB is the amount of betting. You know, I, I bet that I'm going to win. Another guy bets they're going to win. One of us loses. That's $2 if we each bet a dollar. Um, you know, the annual 1 million annualized GMB, that's the figure they're showing. It's like, whoa, it's growing really fast. You know, it went from uh, seven games. It looks like, um, you know, in 2016, you know, to 34 games, you know, so it's enabling a lot of these different games. Um, but, you know, my concern when you think about like, hey, how many games are you enabling that that makes this possible is that don't you usually have like a winner take most dynamic? Like when you think of Fortnite, like you, you create this ecosystem where players know other players and you get bigger and the game gets bigger. And so more people go to it because if you want to find a game more easily, you go to Fortnite. So it makes sense. And that's, that's how you have these huge successes. Um, and effectively the game developers have these big successes. And then if you have like a, a winner takes most dynamic in a given industry, like mobile games, you know, doesn't it sort of create the incentive for the successful players to do it themselves? Like what's the threshold where it's no longer worthwhile to pay a 14% cut, you know, to skills because you're so successful? Or does this always tap out, you know, skills as growth potential long-term? Because if you're just growing above this level, they bring it in-house or they figure out, you know, they hire all the engineers to do it in-house. Um, there's an in inherent inhibitor to this, you know, and, and one, one reason to think that this could be a real risk for them long-term is recently, you know, in the last few months, there's been news about Fortnite and Epic's, Epic is the owner and Apple sort of getting into a fight with each other because, you know, Epic doesn't want Apple to keep taking a 30% take rate on people that wanted to download Fortnite through the App Store. And why should, you know, why should every sale in the Fortnite game 30% go to the Apple App Store when people know and trust the brand? Is the Apple App Store really adding that much value for Fortnite? And so if, if you know, Fortnite's willing to fight for that cut, why wouldn't successful games push back on a 14% take rate um, on, on this? Where that's, you know, that could be pure margin if you build out that functionality yourself. Now, admittedly, for smaller games, you know, where maybe you only have a couple million dollars in, in GMB, um, this would be really valuable because you have the whole army of engineers that Skills has. But for bigger companies, you know, the winner that takes most of the category, I don't think Skills is going to be that valuable for them. Quick non, non sequitur, though, is that Harry Sloan, the CEO of Flying Eagle, which is the, the SPAC that's acquiring uh, the the interest in skills partnered with two other uh, investors, Jeff Saginski and Ellie Baker, who took DraftKings ticker DKNG public in April 2020. This was also through a SPAC, and DraftKings makes money as the enabler slash intermediary of fantasy sports betting. So this is it, it, this is interesting to me, just because you you see the virtual toll booth model seems well in their wheelhouse you know, well, well in their wheelhouse as, you know, one is sports betting and the other is, you know, esports betting. Um, okay. So what, what about skills as financials? Like we've taught, talked about sort of the sexy aspect of their business model. Obviously people have been hot to trot about SPACs recently, but we, you need to make sure that there's actually stake to the sizzle. And the reality is based on this presentation that the management put out, their numbers are impressive. Like, wow. You can see their GMV has gone from 120 million, 365 million to 900 million. They're going to be 1.5. They're guiding to 1.5 billion dollars this year. That's pretty interesting. They're showing that the take rates remain consistently around 14. percent And based on that, you know, if your take rate stays the same and your GMV is going like this, you know, uh, of course your revenue is going to be growing. So their revenue has gone from 17 million to guiding to 225 million this year. You know. 
this is a platform business, so it doesn't surprise me if their gross margins are going to be real high and their, their ultimate profit margins are going to be high. They're not guiding for, for break-even profitability until a few years out, but you know they are going to have some cash on their balance sheet. And I, you know, when you know that you have a platform with 80, 90% gross margins, you're going to be fine long-term as long as you continue to scale. Um, you know, this, especially relative to my last video, this is not all SPACs are pie in the sky businesses. That's, that's the important, you know, lesson here. That's the reason why you have this, oh my God, delicious, delicious piece of apple pie. That, uh, um, but what's, what's the implication for the current valuation? of skills. And honestly, it's not a terrible risk reward while the stock, you know, while the Flying Eagle stock uh, soared uh, on the announcement of the deal. It's it's not terrible. I've, I've definitely seen worse for SPACs, you know, such as businesses with no revenue trading at multi-billion dollar valuation. Um, but you can see based on, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing back of the envelope here. I, I don't have the exact share figure. So I'll, I'll show you the calculation that, it, that I'm using to get into this. But if you if you use a price of like 1470, um, which is where uh, FEAC stock closed on September 2nd, that gets to about $1 billion for FEAC stake. And FEAC is going to own 18% of all of, of all of skills and all of skills will then be publicly traded in time. Uh, and so that implies a total valuation for skills of 5.6 billion dollars. Um, and so here's where it gets interesting is the actual revenue that they, you know, they targeted, and you could see that from here was in 2019, they said was 120 million. So I'm putting that there. And then, you know, I'm putting in their, their guidance of, you know, 225 million for 2020. I'm putting that here. So a range of, you know, 85 to let's say 95% growth for 2020. And this is hypothetical. Um, and then what's the optimized margins? This is, you know, I'm putting in sort of a range based on what I think platform economics can do. You know, of course it could be more than that, but I'm putting, I'm putting in a ballpark figure, 20 to 30%. This is implied operating margins or operating profits, slap on a 25% tax rate. And you could see what the implied, if they were to optimize their margins right now, what the implied earnings multiple would be. And honestly, for, you know, for a company growing at 90, you know, 80, 90% uh, year over year, this multiple isn't crazy. You know, it's, it's, it's not crazy. This is not, you know, pie in the sky territory. This is, it's not crazy. Um, so then, you know, cause, cause I'm, I'm always taking things. I'm not looking to do day trading or anything like that. I'm always trying to, to take the investor perspective, thinking about things, thinking about stocks as actual businesses, not just pieces of paper that you trade. Um, so let's think about this over an investment period over five years. That's what you have here. And what's the assumed revenue growth rate for this business over the next, you know, five years. And, you know, on the low side, I'm saying 30% annualized, which is, that's exceptional. Most businesses don't grow anywhere near that. And 50% is the high side. And once again, most businesses don't go anywhere near that. And you can see what the implied revenue would be for them in 2025 from 800 million to 1.8 billion several years from now. Um, you know, that, that assumes that they continue to execute and deliver and that, you know, they're riding this, this digital game phenomena um, where there's just incredible demand for, for, for what they offer. Um, and you could see, you know, so here, you know, I'm getting um, net earnings of around 100 million to 400 million. And that's a wide range, but that's partially because the growth rates are so high from 300, from, from 30% to 50%, and also from 20 to 30% um, operating margins. And then slap on a multiple, because once again, this is thinking five years out, slap on a multiple of somewhere between 20 and 30 times. You know, this is five years out. Your multiple should be a lot tighter. The business should be proving itself by then. And at that point, you are probably valuing it close to what you think would be an earnings multiple. And so in that case, you get, you know, a, a, a wide range of valuations from 2.5 billion, you know, and, and that's the low side that compares to a total valuation currently of around 5.6 billion. So that would suggest over 50% downside from the current price of around 14, $15 a share. Versus the upside, you know, they continue to grow crazy fast, 
um, a year annualized over the next five years. And you assume a 30 times multiple five years out. And that gets to around $12 billion on the high side, which would be about 100% upside from here. Um, so, you know, once again, this is not a terrible, terrible risk reward. I've certainly seen worse for SPACs. You know, my base case is effectively you break even over five years. But given the speculative fervor out there, it wouldn't surprise me if skills just goes to the moon or FEAC stock just goes to the moon as people learn more about the business and realize this isn't a pie in the sky company. This is a real company delivering real results with a real value proposition that real companies need um, and that, that they're creating real win-win-win dynamics where developers are able to generate more revenue, create more content, users like having more content, therefore they play more games, play more games, more revenues generated, the cycle goes on and on. Um, and also my value proposition to you is that for this company, I'm going to share this valuation sheet in the description below. So you can click on a link, download this if you want, and you can play around with what you think is the fair price. All I ask in exchange is that you subscribe to this channel. And if you really want to support me, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. So once again, if you enjoyed this video, hit subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, hit the like. And if you want to support this channel, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Go to Journey. Your patronage enables the production of these educational videos. And I will throw in my personal investment portfolio, what you can see, what I'm buying and selling each month. What are my top holdings? Why? You can learn about it because oftentimes I'm looking at companies where I'm penciling out the same sort of thing, but I'm saying, hey, I, I only want to own companies that where I think the risk reward is way more attractive. And so you can go to unrivaledinvesting.com for that. Thank you so much for watching.